record now. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining today. It's the December 4th Rec Commission meeting. We've got a, a pretty full agenda of items here. We've got folks who are going to present, <clears throat> excuse me, who are going to be presenting from the town, from Rec Commission, as well as their own members here. I, I think we do have some public that has started to uh, to join here. I look forward to hearing from you guys. We're going to have two opportunities for public comment. The first one right after, essentially right after I, I talk now, will be anybody who would like to make a comment on anything unrelated to our topics of discussion today. Um, and, and then as we go through our actual topics, once we hear from the presenters and once we have a chance to to talk amongst ourselves as a committee, we're going to uh, ask for, for any input or feedback from the public. And at that point, Ray will just let you in um, so you'll have an opportunity to speak. Um, try to keep your comments within three minutes if possible. Um, yeah, I, and I think that's it. So uh, first order of minute, order of um, on the agenda would be the approval of minutes. Uh, we chatted a little bit uh, before we all grouped here we've got the minutes, but uh, not all of us have had a chance to read them. So we're going to just push that uh, action item on to our next month's agenda. Um, all right, we can, I think now move over to public comment. Uh, Ray, are there anybody, anyone in the public who's interested in making a comment that is not related to one of the items on the agenda? Uh, just raise your hand so Ray can, can uh, um, call, call on you. Otherwise, you, again, you'll have your chance to speak uh, on specific topic items when we get to them. All right. I don't see anybody, Ray. So and uh, for minutes for this meeting. Oh, yes. Um, can we get a volunteer to take minutes? I'll volunteer, I guess. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it, as always. All right. Uh, with those items taken care, I, I should also, as I'm looking at the the attendees should also point out that um, we do have uh, everyone from the committee on except for Gene, uh, so Sanjay, Jonas, Chris, Matt, Jeremy, myself. All right, um, Ray, why don't you uh, get us started? We can have Dave and Amy come on and give us the latest on pickleball. I will. I will then elevate Dave and Amy right now. Wrong way. <laughs> so we should have, did we lose somebody? Um, so uh, the where we are right now, we are in a little bit of the- Amy, I'm sorry, Ray, Dave, I think is still in the attendees. I think he's in the process. Oh, and okay. Hurt. If not, yeah, got yeah, it. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, as you know, since we last spoke, uh, pickleball uh, has been a has has been a, a, you know sort of a point of contention for for our site plan for a lot of different things. I can give you a little bit of a background, Commission. Um, we did receive the Missy Meadows uh, uh, Homeowners Association did. Uh, research in response to our uh, our site plan and in response to the the CPA proposal, did present a um, an argument against the 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 courts being cited in the Kiwanis uh, on the Kiwanis field. Um, they they brought up a, a number of different, very relevant, very important uh, arguments uh, about the nature of the pickleball sport and. And uh, you know it's a its impact on neighborhood and community, and they wanted to try and make sure that their their voice was heard in that process, so that it didn't end up right on top of them. Uh, we met after the original, the last time we met, we met to discuss our you know what our plans and what our proposal was, what we were presenting to the CPA. Um, uh, we did at at when we introduced those projects to the to the CPA. And the Misty Meadows community did also produce, present their 
their arguments against that proposal. We sat down with Missy Meadows, with representatives of Missy Meadows, to try to uh, you know, certainly hear them in the process. It was very much part of the process we did. This was not after the decision was already made. This was during the decision-making process. Uh, they were they were willing to come in and speak to us. They're willing to come in and participate in a sit-down conversation with us. And I believe that both sides considered that to be a relatively uh, productive conversation. We have, on the, on the part of the town, we agreed to go back to the drawing board and look at some of the other options some of the other options that were still uh, option one, option two, option three, to look at some of the other options that we had uh, in acknowledgement of the of the interest of that community and in, of the interest in, in due process and the interest of making sure that, that this project that everybody agreed was an important one was situated in the right space. Um, and so uh, the, the timing is interesting for us because we are in the process of having the conversation with CPA. We're in the process of, of, of pushing forward an important request for funding for this project. And the site plans, uh, Dave, Amy, and the rest of our, of our team, uh, we, did, we did want to make sure that we were making a, a uh, we're providing the CPA with enough information to be able to, to, be able to make a, a, a funding decision in our favor. Um, real quick, Ray, Matt. Yes. I'm sorry, Matt, I see your hand up. Did you have something to jump in real fast? Yeah, so as opposed to the other Recreation Commission members, I have a little bit more heads up on this because I was in the, the CPA meeting um, last Thursday where the Misty Meadows Association uh, discussed, or not the last Thursday, the Thursday before. Oh, the, sorry, Thursday before the, the Thanksgiving Thursday, so I guess two and a half three and a half weeks ago or something. And then I also received those documents that Ray just sent out 10 minutes ago uh, on Monday. So I had a chance to look at it. Um, but my question, and maybe you discussed this in your, your meeting with them, is that their principal um, concern seems to be that they think that pickleball courts are too close. Now, um, aside from one house, which is 240 or so feet, the, the second closest house is over 300 feet away. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that being too close. So um, their too close argument seems to be based on um, one source, which is just some blogger who wrote an article saying pickleball decreases property values. And he just, as far as I can tell, made up numbers about how close was too close. So um, maybe you have more insight into that. Maybe real quick, Ray, before you answer, Dave and Amy, do you have uh, like anything prepared that you want to go through first, and then maybe we can hit questions afterwards? Or is that is it, are we ready to talk? Um, uh, I th yeah, I, I think Amy and I are here really just kind of to answer questions and and help you guide the conversation in any way. Um, we don't have anything prepared. Uh, just in terms of Matt. You know your questions just now. I I do know that members of the community, the um, the abutters and neighbors to Kiwanis are here in the audience, but they're, you know, it is more than you know. I I think we should acknowledge it is more than just bloggers. Um, you know, there are a number of pickleball. There are a number of communities in Massachusetts, you know, who are grappling with this very same issue, who have built pickleball courts and and discovered, you know, that that the noise caused by the paddle hitting the ball um, can be quite uh, disrupting to residents. Yeah, I mean, the bar. So, absolutely. I can understand if it's over the fence or across the street, that makes sense. But um, what is, who, who is, how are we determining too close? Because if 300 feet is too close, I think you're going to find trouble anywhere in town. Yeah. So in short, before we open it up, so we've, we've really looked carefully and, and we're, we're feeling some time pressure, as as uh, Ray indicated, and there's no easy answers to this. I mean, there, you know, we we've looked at uh, distance to to abutters. We've looked at some of the financial limitations. Um, you know, each alternative. If you know, we 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 started out looking at all of our recreation areas, and we we landed on on Kiwanis as a possibility. So 
we're still open. We want to hear your guidance and feedback tonight. And and why don't I leave it at that? And and Amy and I can answer questions. Go ahead, Amy. If uh, yeah, all I was gonna add was um, you know, partly why we really wanted to have this conversation is because what what we're grappling with is what's the trade-off for you know distance from a butter versus cost versus um, you know, some of these other, um, you know, potentially putting it at a site that maybe fits those two criteria, but then maybe you're taking a space away from another sport because um, maybe you're putting it over tennis courts or over a softball field. And so that's a lot of what we're hoping you guys can provide us feedback for um, is just how do you weigh some of these different options that we're going to have to make? Um, well, well I think you versus... have to... Have to something's going to be compromised in, it, in the it, decision because there's not one that's going to be the lowest cost option that's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet away from a property and that isn't going to take space away from another sport. So we need help kind of prioritizing those competing needs. Makes sense. Uh, Ray, hey, I, I've got, if you can let me pull up my screen, I just for reference, I have a map which has a 300 or 500 a thousand foot ring. And on we'll it to pull that up and i also point out that jonas has his hand up yeah i'm gonna get to him next okay, i just wanted to make sure that we saw yeah uh, share screen it seems like jonas the take it the main away potential, okay seems like the main potential issue is noise um it is a public park so i feel like there's not a lot of expectations that it won't be used as a public park so it seems like the question is what will the noise be so couldn't we do just a low tech basically free test to get get some paddles, get some pickleballs, go over there, get some, I don't know, some kind of surface, knock them around, go 300 feet away. Can you hear it? If you can't, you know, it's low tech. We don't have the money, you know, for anything more scientific, but I think it'd be a shame to derail this whole, all the planning you've done based on something that might not even be an issue. So, so uh, that, that, Thank you for that. Um, I will also speak to the to the out argument against this and say that uh, what you're describing there is basically a sound study. Uh, one of the things that the community has been interested in in pushing forward in that process is to is to have a sound study done to figure out just what the effect is, as opposed to us assuming that that hey, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be so. So they're talking about a sound study. They recommended a sound study for just what that impact would be, a rudimentary one that you described there, or to or to make sure that we do it right. Um, and so I will speak. I, I will say that that's that. That's that. Uh, I think you're saying the same thing that we can go out there and test it and see what the effect would be of having this court there and looking at, and at some of the existing information and to, and to plan off of that. We are looking at that as being part of this process also. It could be a, it could be a cost in the process. It could be something that we're looking at as being, as being just something that's important information for us and citing it here or citing it wherever. Um, Go ahead. Sure. I'm sorry, Andrew. No, I, I mean, I, it's a great um, suggestion, Jonas, and happy to hear that that's part of the formal consideration. Um, uh, just for folks who can see this, this is, I, I only looked through that article briefly. This is, a, I'm citing the court right about here. Um, this first ring is 330 feet, which was a number that was referenced in the one of the documents that was shared. This is 500 feet, and this is 1,000 feet. Uh, just again for for perspective. Um, all right. Uh, so, I guess uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like I don't think three hundred feet is too close. Um, I, I just say I want to have an actual basis for that number. Whether it's something like Jonas's test, whether it's something like going to another neighborhood, whether it's referencing what's actually happening in other towns in Massachusetts. But I, I, I'm I'm going to want to have some kind of like now that this concern is raised some more information about like what actually constitutes too close because i'm surprised that 300 feet would be too close but i don't know anything about pickleball also i noticed that ryan harb had had his hand up in the attendees i don't know if he wanted to comment 
Yeah, I'm going to just go across the panel real quick here, and then we'll, we're going to open up to some uh, some public comment. Um, Jean, see your hand up. Yeah, I mean, we really haven't had time to read all the documents, so I don't know if there's more than just the sound issue that they're concerned with. Um, and I did notice those who many who signed live on Tamarack Drive, which you said is probably about a thousand feet away. So, I mean, yeah. that seems like... I don't, I mean, I'm here at Mount Holyoke right now. Like we, our tennis courts are probably about that far away. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I, again, I think like we need more scientific, like exact measurements and testing to, to see, you know, what, what other issues, you know, there are and how really this would be effective. Again, there might be more issues in the documents. I hadn't had a chance to really look at them. As a matter. Is, is it now just, just the sound? Yes, as a matter of information, I can tell you that the three other uh, the three other referred points were parking uh, in the area, increased parking. Uh, it was uh, property value, the effect on property value in the area, and it was effect on on other programming in the at Kiwanis Park. Those were the three that they cited. Would this? If this went in, would this impact pro other programming? Is this this space isn't utilized for anything right now? I can tell you that 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 is one of the reasons why it was selected is because mm -hmm. it has zero impact on on the other uses of Kiwanis Park. Other than pickleball, it does not affect uh, uh, its space that was not previously uh, used for recreation purposes. Uh, it's converting over basically a a small hill and a and and uh, you know unprogrammed space. Got it. Um, I guess maybe just a real quick overview then. So, I so in terms of from Amy and Dave, things that you you looked at when you got to this spot in the first place were things like the programming, but you also looked at I know like access for uh, ADA as well. Are there other things just? that we should be aware of that helped you land on this particular site? Uh, I would just- Or, or rule I, out other ones? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good idea to maybe stay focused on this one for the time being, because when we when we look at other recreation areas, you throw in a whole host of other factors that we consider. But yeah, these are the main ones, that it was unprogrammed space. There was an existing parking uh, area there that, you know, for much of the year, this is an underutilized recreation area. Um, and two, financial considerations were smack dab, you know, in the top three. This yeah. is one of the, this is probably the least expensive place that we can build, build new pickleball courts, not refurbish old courts or anything like that. But we've looked at the finances and this is a flat, dry piece of land that um, is relatively inexpensive from our standpoint. We still need probably $220,000 to do it for three courts, um, but that's relatively inexpensive compared to the other sites. Yeah. I don't know if Amy wants to add anything. No, I think you you hit them all. Very good. All right, Jonas, let's hit you and then we'll let's go to public comment. Yeah, just wondering to quantify parking. Um, we're talking three pickleball courts, uh, probably four players most at a time on those courts, so maybe 12, 12 players, five people waiting, maybe, 17, 20 people, maybe, at any given time. Um, I guess worst case, 20 cars, best case, 10 cars. So just wondering about quantifying that. And obviously, it's very anecdotal and rough, but. Any feedback, Dave, or I guess Amy, or anybody else? relative to the parking demands on most days there's you know between the parking lot behind the pump station and the parking lot over near the um small diamond over on the other side there's plenty of parking for that for the pickleball use again this is this is not mill river this is not Grove park this is a park that on many many days of the year is a quiet place to throw a ball to your dog or you know or throw a ball. Um, we don't heavily program it currently, but I, I will acknowledge that traffic, you know, increased traffic in general, um, 
was a concern. And, and uh, I think Ray mentioned parking slash traffic, um, noise, uh, property values, et cetera. So, and, and of course the, the paddle noise. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I I just wanted to try to get clear. I'm looking forward to hearing comment from the public. Um, and thanks to everyone who's attending, including Amy and Dave. I was hoping that we could clarify what we're trying to accomplish this evening under this agenda item. I think as, as many, but not all people understand, this is an advisory commission to the Department of Recreation. Um, and so unlike committees like planning uh, or CPA, we don't have any decision-making authority, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, we, during the CPA process, uh, reviewed the recreation proposals and provided comment via um, Matt to the CPA commission. And so I wonder if we could try to clarify our objective tonight as a commission. And I, I think maybe what the way I would phrase it is we could decide to reaffirm our recommendation. Uh, we could decide to suggest or recommend further action, such as a sound study. Um, we could conceivably decide to reverse our recommendation, um, or we could do nothing. And uh, so I, I don't necessarily mean to step completely in front of public commenters and have a long discussion about this, but I think it would be helpful for us as a commission to be focused on um, some decision making, right, within the context of our rights and responsibilities as a part of town government, um, to maybe prevent us from simply having very open ended discussion and conversation about the the myriad issues that are being covered by different departments of the town. Yeah, I, that's, I think, very well said, Sanjay. The way I was envisioning this was the outcome would be providing map guidance through the CPA lens as a voice of the Rec Commission. Um, I think your four, rec, your four suggestions make sense, right? Continue further action, reverse, or do nothing. Um, I, I would hope that the panel could come up with um, a recommendation for Matt to carry forward to CPAC. But that would be the extent. You are correct that we're an advisory body. Ray, did you have any other expectations? I would, I would say that because of your that and on that same note, because you do have the ability to uh, give your your consent to give your to give your approval to Matt as a representative on that commission uh, on that committee, I would say that it's important for you to also this uh, if the the public comments come in for you to hear that as you have already you've heard our our push this whole time you've heard why we wanted Kiwanis as you give Matt that feedback uh, as Matt carries forward to CPA I think it's important that you that you sort of hear some of the information that that is uh, that, that's there also very good to Dave yeah Dave Anything to add? Uh, yeah, I would just add that I, I think from a staff standpoint, you know, working with Ray and Amy and, and our town engineer and wetlands administrator and other staff, I think I, I recognize, uh, you know, you are advisory, but I think you're, you're also advisory to the town manager and his staff. So we would like your feedback. CPA, to some degree, doesn't really have the power to say, you know, their job is not to say, don't do this at Kiwanis. It's really to fund Pickleball in Amherst or not. So I just want to make sure it's a broader, your guidance comes to Matt as he takes that to CPAC, but it's also to staff. We also have to recognize that the, um, just to, to put it in perspective, the planning board um, we'll eventually hear this wherever pickleball goes or wherever we propose, we'll, we'll hear this through a site plan review process. So hearing from you and giving your recommendation to staff, that will also go to the planning board, which does actually have authority on the site. They have a, a lot more um, um, uh, regulatory power, if you will, to kind of guide where this goes. 
So I just wanted to put that in broader perspective that staff is looking for your advice and that will flow to yes, CPAC, but also to uh, the planning board and also Great. the the design the, the design review board and the uh, disability access advisory commission. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Matt, is it quick or can we get to public comments? Um, yeah, just to expand on what Dave said, uh, the CPAC decision is whether or not to fund pickleball in general. And Dave's concern is that if pickleball is to be built, but not at Kiwanis, the fun, the amount might be different. But uh, but yeah. So that's why this is coming up now. That's that's it. Okay. Thank you all. All right, Ray. Let's just start. Um, invite anybody from the public who'd like to make a comment can do so. Uh, a comment uh, relative to pickleball can do that now. Can you? Can you get me off of the share screen? See sharing your screen, or can I do that from here? Uh, where is my okay. attendees? I do have two hands raised. Ryan Harb was the first one. I will allow Ryan to speak. Hi, Ryan. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi, would, Ryan. Would there be hey, hey, Ray. Hey, Dave. Good to see you again. Um, would there be any way for me to to share anything on on this call tonight? Like as far as a share screen goes, would because I, I I was hearing some comments and you know I I, I know you're looking for more of a basis, like more scientific you know type stuff than just like the one email that was sent. And so my my concern is tonight, just you know this is before me going into my comment, but concern would be making a recommendation tonight without having having all that like at your fingertips. And I, I think I could help with that because it's been a lot of research and a lot of work that, you know, has been done. And it's really, if I was in like your, your guys' shoes, it's seeing this like community response right now saying, hey, we don't want pickleball courts at Kiwanis Park. And then you're probably like trying to figure out, is this real or not? Is there real issues? And there's not a lot of time to kind of make that decision on your end. And so it's it I, I can just tell that this sort of process right now we're in sort of a time squish and so my my hope would be i because i i have this like very well organized i could probably answer a lot of questions if i had the ability to just do a really quick share screen and show you just a couple of documents that i have what, would it what be do you possible guys think is that is that would it be possible to email that to ray and he can pull it up on ray, his screen and he can pull it up on his screen um then yeah, po possibly some of them are. Um, I think it would be hard logistically. I think. Um, or you could just promote him to panel right now because then I would have to stop and. I will defer oh, say, to say that the again. Now, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm fine with that. I don't know whether the town, like, whether there's any protocol in letting anybody to share stuff, but um, I guess uh, Dave or Ray, any concerns with? Someone from the public sharing your screen? No. All right. Then, then let's uh, let's let's do this, and then just, yeah, keep keep your documents focused to, to the task at hand. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Thanks, guys. I, I appreciate it. I'm um, going to promote Ryan to panelist. Is that 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 would be the way to do it, right? I believe so. Okay. Awesome. Are you, are you Zoom um, competent, Ryan, to share your screen? I presume. Andy, sorry, this is Sanjay. I wonder if you could just offer a little clarity on the timing yes. here. Are we asking Ryan to still remain within the three minutes that's allocated to public comment? And the reason I ask is because we need to make sure that we treat all members of the public equally and fairly. Um, and it it sounds like what Ryan is about to do may take substantially longer than three minutes, which is going to open the door for other members of the public to expect the same opportunity. Yeah, can we can we keep this as brief as you can, Ryan? Try to keep it to that three minutes. Yeah, yeah, I guess de definitely. Uh, could you guys give me like uh, at at three minutes? Just say, hey, we're at three yeah, minutes now. I'm not going to pull the plug, but you understand what okay. we're saying here is we want to make sure everyone has fair opportunity. Definitely, and I respect that completely. Um, and and then just the one thing, I guess, going back to my original comment is we're trying like making a recommendation tonight with just like a a, a few short minutes is that that's the challenge that we're all in. So I'm just kind of you know putting that out there to the group. So let me, I'll do a share screen now just to get into it, then call me out when I'm at uh, at three minutes. So here we go. 
Okay. Can you guys see my screen or everybody see my screen? We can, Ryan. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so I, Dave and Ray um, and Carolyn Naylor, we, we, we did this presentation together. So I brought this um, when we had our two-hour meeting together before Thanksgiving. So I, I just wanted to walk through this very quickly. The, fir the first slide being just pickleball has been the fastest growing sport in the U.S. And our group is not anti-pickleball at all. We're totally like what I want tonight to be about is not having us prevent anything from going forward and saying we don't want pickleball being approved as part of the CPA funds. We're actually completely in support of that. It's just how much is it going to cost to do it? Where is the best location to do it? So that's what we're trying to get to. Um, there's been a rapid growth period of pickleball where 2,500 forts have been built over the past like three years across the country. A lot of them were built in residential neighborhoods. And then what, what has happened is we're in this sort of unintended consequences phase where all of a sudden there's communities all across the country like popping up and saying courts were built here and now we're hearing the noise and now it's really disrupting our lives. So it's just coming out now. It's the ones that were built like two years ago and people have really started complaining about it. So th this is what's happened is there's been closures of pickleball courts across Massachusetts. And so one question was, what, what is that distance? How far away is like 220 feet, 500 feet, 300 feet? What, what is that distance? And so that I'm going to get to that. There's best practices now that are emerging from across the country. So this is just a few pickleball courts in Massachusetts that were closed. Uh, there was a court injunction. There's been lawsuits. I'm not saying this is scare anybody. It's just this is facts. This is what's been happening. So there, there was one uh, ordinance that came out in Centennial, Colorado. This is probably the most famous one or the one that people are looking to right now. Uh, they declared uh, a moratorium on building pickleball courts within 500 feet from residential. I'm going quick. So I, I will send this presentation if you all haven't seen it. I think this was not part of my original email, but I just wanted to kind of walk through this. So the best practice is emerging right now. 500 feet is sort of a minimum, but 600 feet from residential to edge of pickleball court is a best practice. And by doing this, you would not need a noise impact assessment or a sound study if you're 600 feet or greater. Now, the challenge is finding a, a place, a park, 600 feet um, or more from residential. So we'll get to that. Um, how to measure it is not from the middle of the pickleball courts, but from the edge. This is the best practice, edge of pickleball court, because that's where the noise is, you know, it can be from the edge of the court to the edge of residential. And then it's just what, you know, what do you need? How much do you need to spend on it? So there, there's a couple things. I know I'm getting close to three minutes. You can get sound curtains, which is this top picture, or sound panels. If you're closer to residential, you need more sound abatement. If you're farther away, you can do this. It's kind of like cheap, cheaper stuff. It's called acoustic fence. But either way, you need tall fencing in order to um, mitigate sound. So right now, I think... One of the costs was fencing in the proposal. It was four feet fencing, but that's not going to be enough for doing any sort of sound abatement. Um, yeah, the, these are just different things. I was getting quotes, um, Dave Ray. I just wanted to kind of work alongside you. Like what I'm hoping from this process is all the research, all the care that we have about, you know, pickleball courts affecting um, the, the neighborhood. We wanted to get real quotes and kind of work with you guys. So for getting like a wrap around the court, 10 feet high, we're looking at about 50,000 for that sound curtain. That's for the, the sort of cheaper one. And then the sound panels are a lot more expensive. Um, so here's a couple just different locations. Kiwanis, that was the first one. When we did the measurement, it's really close, guys. It's not 220 feet. That would be from edge to the house. But you have to think of it as to the property line because people are outside on decks. They're outside in their gardens. So we're actually a lot closer than the 220 feet. It's 85 feet to the closest one here. If the courts were a little this way, it might've been 120 feet, but we're, we're really close on this one. Um, we wrap it up, Brian. The, the next one was Mill River that you guys... Yeah, totally. So just looking at different locations and costs and everything. Mill River, we talked about putting, the, putting it here in our last meeting. This is about 400 feet from, from closest. So it's a little bit better from a location. There's a lot more parking and there's other things here. Um, and the other one we just looked at, which, um, sorry, Groff Park. And that one, we were talking about a location that's potentially 500 feet. And this would be probably the best location that we found, I think, so far in Amherst. One other one would be Plumbrook. 
So I just wanted to throw that out there as different locations might have actually different sound abatement and then different costs. And so I wanted to open it up to just, you know, this is how you measure them. This is sort of the best practice is 500 feet. Um, the very best would be 600 feet. And we have sites that are better than others. And All so right. the very last thing I'm going to show, and I want to show you guys, uh, I can stop there. I know I'm at time. Yeah, so, that, anyway. that would, yeah if you don't mind. I'll I mean, stop. I think we get the point. You've done some research on, on other sites you consider. I know obviously the town has as well. Let's... Um, and um, I will... If, I believe I have this, uh, the email was given to me, the, the slide that they shared. And so I can share that with the commission. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. And just maybe if I can say one thing to wrap it up before the last comment, I won't share my screen anymore, but just, just, I know we have to make a, make a decision on sort of a recommendation and, you know, just my, my hope would be to just be really careful with this decision. It's just something that's been so highly sensitive and so polarizing in communities that it's caused so much conflict. And there's all these and all these people out there that have real complaints and real negative health effects. And it's caused so much community divide. And I know it's it almost seems crazy. It's almost like I feel like the crazy one where I'm talking to you all and saying, no, no pickleball courts. And people are like, what's the big deal about pickleball courts? But until you like dive into it and you start listening to people who've been impacted it's like a really, really big issue that's been happening all across the state and all across the country. And so what people have done before is just not think it's an issue and make a kind of a quick decision. And so the, my, my ending point is just yeah. being really careful with it and just trying to take in all the information, all the research to, to make. Thank you, Ryan. A slow you. and thoughtful decision on, on this. So thank you, thank Ryan. you guys. All right, uh, Ray. Can we can we move on to look yes. at maybe next? Uh, next up, one second. Next, we have Pat Anabaku. Hello, Pat. Welcome. Yes. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> Pat Anabaku from Tamarack Drive. I'm one of the abutters and board member for Mr. Meadow. I'm the vice president. First of all, I want to thank the town for reconsidering its position and for working with uh, some members of my neighborhood. Um, I know that um, some representatives met with town officials. Um, I don't have much to say, but to, to urge this committee, this commission to look for alternative sites for the pickleball. It doesn't matter if some houses in my neighborhood is very far away. The reason why I moved to this neighborhood more than 30 years ago is the diversity. And we are like big family. If something affects one, uh, one family, it affects all of us. So it's not about folks who live in Tamarack Drive or folks who live on Stanley Street, the proximity, it's not about that. And finally, what I want to say, let's do this uh, peacefully and avoid lawsuit. So um, governance is not an option. Please, let's do this in a most um, peaceful manner. Thank you. Oh, one more thing I want to add. I think that the the town corrected itself, but as an aborder, I never received, my family never received any notification from the town. It does not matter the distance where my house is located. All uh, houses in my neighborhood should have received notification from our town. And as I speak tonight, I did not receive anything up till today. Thank you Thank for you, your Pat. time. Thank you, Pat. Thank yeah. you, Pat. Um, I get just real quick on that last point. The the notification would occur when this goes to the planning board. Is that is that right? It procedurally, is there any reason why that we would be sending out notice to abutters at this at this point? Some did. I think three or four yeah. houses oh, did. I, I'm sorry, Pat. Uh, can we let Dave answer? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So all throughout the process, there are requirements for. Uh, about our notifications. So the 
the formal one that has occurred already was when the Conservation Commission reviewed the pickleball site proposal. And that was that legally that requirement is everyone, uh, every residence within 300 feet of the property line of, of Kiwanis Park, a town's park. So everyone within 300 feet should have received that. The Conservation Commission reviewed it. And then uh, the next would be the planning board. Um, again, depending on how these discussions go and the CPAC goes, uh, I believe the planning board is slated to hear about this proposal later this month. That might be postponed to another date in January if if we're not, you know, if it, we've got a lot okay. to discuss here. So okay. uh, and I don't recall that setback, or excuse me, that it might be 300 feet again. It might be further. But anyway, that that meeting may be postponed based on all these conversations. So we'll okay. Thanks, Dave, for clarifying that. All right, um, Ray, can we move to our next? Thank you, Pat. Speaker? Yes, next is Richard Bogarts. Yes, um, I raised my hand to speak because I was wondering whether I could uh, donate my three minutes to Ryan, but. That's passe. Uh, I also did not receive any notification, and I'm the second house in on Willow. <laughs> uh, I only recently heard about this issue. I haven't been paying attention to pickleball uh, very much. I'm concerned about the noise. I will await your actions. I thought the many suggestions that Ryan made were quite right on, and um, I'll leave it at that. Very good. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, Thank you. I have one more hand right now. It's uh, Mr. Carlos Toriago. <laughs> Welcome, Carlos. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this these conversations really have been great to me. Uh, hi, Ray. Hi, David. Good to see both of you. Um, the topic is a topic that involved the whole community. Uh, I've been a dweller on Willow Lane for the last 20 plus years of my life with my family. And Listening to everybody, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to share. The first one is, if we're going to make a decision, let's be informed. Let's find out what is out there. Let's do a little bit of homework. Because if we don't do the homework, uh, some decision might probably look to some of us quite unfair. And I like what I saw tonight. Some people are changing their mind in terms of what they said and what they heard and adjusting, shifting a little bit the thinking. I'm concerned that we make a decision without having information about the issue, some of us are going to be a little bit unhappy. I have something that I created for this conversation called the golden rule of neighborhood. Don't do to my neighborhood what you don't want me to do to yours. Let's talk. If this is the town that we love, let's come together and find a solution where the pick ball will be placed and everybody will be okay with it. Simple. It's very simple. And I ask you, please make a, an informed decision. Learn a little bit more about this and we can learn together. And together we can make the best decision for the town and for the whole community. I don't wanna to get to the position where I have to disagree with my neighbors because I don't like that. There's no need for that. And for the town, for the town spirit, for the town community, and let's work together. Let's educate ourselves and make the most, the, the wisest decision in terms of where the location that everybody's okay with it. I will speak up for my community. I will speak up for my neighbors. And I will speak up for you too, if I had to. I will, I promise. Thank you, Carlos. Um. I have a, I I have a, a second hand raised, I believe, by Richard Bogarts. Uh, That's just a legacy hand there. It may be a legacy hand. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, Richard, if you are if you are still looking to try and if you're trying to try to speak again, leave your hand up. Otherwise, take your hand down, please. Does the commission mind my uh, bringing Richard Bogarts back? Let's just let's just lower all the hands. Okay. And then, and then if he wants to opt in again, he can. But we've got comments okay. from folks here. Let's sort of hear on this stuff now. Um, any, um, I guess, as we consider some of the feedback that we've heard there. Uh, and we I'm think sorry, about Andy. Uh, Richard's hand was up. Uh, Richard, are you trying to speak? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, I just want to make a, a comment about procedure. And that is the committee's members are all faces that are speaking to us. And they're very human in that way. And the people who are speaking from the community are faceless. And that renders them a little bit less human. And I would think it would be more appropriate to have a procedure in which when you ask someone to speak, you show them. That's all. Thank you. Andy. All right. Yeah, no, let's let just want to open the floor up now to committee members as, as you've heard that, you know, with the charge we discussed going into this, uh, into the public comment of providing some guidance to uh, Matt, providing some guidance to Dave, Amy, and Ray. Um, is there any new information that we heard there that we'd like to talk about as a committee? Matt. Yeah, so um, Ryan Harb has obviously been doing a lot of research and uh, that what he shared today was something I hadn't seen before and I appreciate all that research. And um, uh, I think what he's saying and uh, we need to read it and review it to verify the veracity of it. But um, what he is saying does make sense. If if communities around the country are establishing a five to 600 foot um, line, then we have to we have to be cognizant of that if that is what is actually happening. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that makes sense. And I look forward to to reading the what Ryan said myself. And I hope that I, I expect that that Ray and Dave are thinking similarly. All right, I will just say real quick from the radii search I had done there, even moving it over 500 feet gets you about 10 houses. Right. And I think one thing that it's important for us to keep in mind based on what Dave and Amy shared earlier is that, you know, from a cost effective perspective, you know, while you might be able to put something out in the middle of Groff Park, which is further than 500 feet away, the cost to build that, um, I imagine, would be su substantially more to the point where it really comes down to do you want pickleball or not? Right. Um, OK, Jonas. Well, I guess I would echo what Matt said about uh, some revelations about the the noise in um, community communities' reactions. Um, and I guess we've established there's really no other place within Kiwanis that this could go, right, without encroaching on other recreation. Um, the, these softball diamonds are both kind of used, and we, we don't want to get to the point where we're um, making a trade off there, I assume. Amy, Dave, can you confirm that? Yeah, Amy? Well, all, I mean, all I was going to say is certainly that's that's a conversation that I'd appreciate your guys' feedback on. Are we okay with, say, compromising the softball fields there or compromising um, tennis at Mill River to put them there? Um, I, th I think that those are all conversations that we'd like your guys' input on. Can we be reminded why that that site within Kiwanis is ideal cost wise. Is there like um sub substrate or like is there already concrete you know pavement there and it's flat or like what are those flat and dry. Flat and dry. Flat and dry. It, it's flat and dry. It's also right next to parking. So anytime you put it not next to parking, then you need an access path yep. to get all of the construction equipment there. And then you also need an ADA accessible path to get there, which may or may not be the same thing to get there. Um, you also need parking. Um, so if you were to go, say, to the cow pasture, 
there's not existing parking there. So we'd have to either have parking or we'd have to have a sidewalk or a crosswalk to connect it to other area parking. Um, so those are some of the costs that come in at some of the other locations. Right, and I think I've, I've tried to do uh, soccer, summer soccer at Kiwanis Park. It was not a non-starter, no, no goals, the fields weren't good. So I'm wondering, is it maybe ultimate is still using it sporadically? So that's why we couldn't just put it in the middle of that part, you know, far away uh, on one of the corners. There's there's kind of opposing softball that is used. I don't know how much the baseball in the opposing corner is used. And then often in kind of nuzzled between the two infields is where we put ultimate and soccer. It's the layout for that. And the other thing, I guess, just kind of to keep in mind, <laughs> the, the challenge of all of this is also, um, you know, with Fort River being constructed, um, they're going to start tearing that up, you know, this spring. And so we're going to have several recreation areas taken offline. And so some of these sites like Kiwanis that, you know, the, like the soccer that might not be used that much, but this year, you know, over the next couple of years might get higher usage. Um, so it's a challenge. I guess. Stole my thunder, Amy. That's right <laughs> oh, where ahead. I was Sorry. going. You stole my thunder. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jonas. Jeremy, take it away. Yeah. Amy did steal a little bit of my thunder, but that was, uh, which I appreciate actually, because that was what I was thinking about is that I know there's going to be upcoming construction that's going to mitigate field usage, which is, I'm sure, was considered by Dave and Amy going in which is part of why Kiwanis was the site chosen. I think it comes back to something I've heard, for me anyways, it comes back to something I heard from Sanjay. It is a complex question, I'm not trying to minimize it, but it would be an addition to the town, it'd be an additional amenity and service the town doesn't currently have. And I understand, I wanna be sensitive to everyone's feelings who lives in town. I live in town myself. I don't I haven't lived here for 30 years. I've only been here for less than a decade myself, but I will say that I feel like it's another one of these scenarios where it's an amenity that the town should have. I will say, I felt like recusing myself somewhat. I play pickleball. It happens in Greenfield on Sundays. A great buddy of mine works out at the gym. I played it before. It's a great sport. Rarely is it played when the sun goes down. Rarely is it played at six or five in the morning. It, and also as a previous outdoor basketball player in my life, I can say basketball is way more intrusive than pickleball ever is in terms of noise and noise disturbance. So also I have read a lot of what Ryan submitted prior to Ryan submitting it, because as a pickleball player and fan, you read about these sorts of things because it's in the community. A lot of these, I would just suggest that everybody read through some of the information, understand the communities that are indicating injunctions and indicating not that our community is not in some of those folds, but um, I'm an advocate for it. I'll continue to be an advocate for it. So Amy and Dave and Matt, if you're asking my opinion, I advocate for the existing plan. The existing plan seems pretty terrific. It's pretty outstanding. I think it'd be an amenity. I understand people's concerns, but pickleball, as a person who's played it, 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 I don't know. I, I live next door to people who are renters, who party, the kid, students. It is that is way more intrusive than any pickleball I've ever seen. So I don't know. I know it's recorded, but that's my two cents. Thank you, Jeremy. Team. Yes, I mean, I'm very appreciative of uh, um, everyone's comments, um, the pres mini presentation there. I would like to know more, but it seems like I don't know if the attendees realize that the committee or other people have looked into other spaces. It's not like we just went into Kiwanis and said, OK, this is where we're going to do it. Um, you know, Mill Valley was looked at. Or that was the original site. Um, but for whatever the reasons that were not conducive to setting up the courts there, we moved on to other sites. So I'm not just wanted to make sure that all the attendees knew that we, you know, we just didn't go to Kiwanis and said, this is where we're going to put it. The research has been done to find out what would be one of the best sites cost wise, you know, for all the reasons that we've already talked about. And that's why Kiwanis was, was chosen. So I feel like if it's not going to happen at Kiwanis, it's almost, it's not going to happen. And I think pickleball needs to happen in Amherst. Very good. Thanks, Jean. Um, I guess, Chris or Sanjay, I don't want to put you on the spot, but just since we're, we kind of, I think, heard from most folks, anything you'd like to add? I do not have anything further. 
I think I'd have to put some thought into it. Um, I, I, I kind of get where everybody's coming from. I, I kind of agree that the other sites have been deemed like it's probably the best site. I mean, in my eyes, I was driving by the high school basketball court the other day. I put it there, but I don't know where the pool project stands. You know, it's more central to the center of town. You're going to rip those basketball courts up anyways. And then the other thing is, I mean, sometimes I think I just, I, I got to go out there and see where they're thinking visually at Kiwanis, or maybe I'll go out there in the next day or two and see it. All right. Um, I had, a, I guess, just a thought on the sort of the noise attenuation. Is that something, Dave and Amy, that we were, I'm sorry if you had already said this and I forgot, but that is that something that was the town planning on doing any sort of noise attenuation study or that that was just a suggestion by um, neighbors? I think it's a suggestion, you know, a strong recommendation. I would say it's a strong recommendation from Ryan and other members of the association and, and about others. So that's definitely something we're considering. And, you know, based on the feedback we've gotten from you tonight and from the neighbors um, about others, I, I think, um, you know, we will certainly consider whether you know, is is there some opportunity to at Kiwanis to move this way on the southern end of Kiwanis and do a, a sound study at the same time? That adds cost. As Amy said, you need a access road slash walkway to get there. You know, if you're 400 or, you know, more feet away, uh, we've we've spoken to Ryan and, and other uh, members of the group. Um, and and I think the the advice is is sound. We sorry, I didn't mean to put that pun in there, but yes, there would need to be a sound study. Um, I I think that advice is is solid. Um, I will say we've looked very hard at Groff Park, and although we can achieve some separation there, the cost to put pickleball courts on the northern end above northern end of Groff Park above the new spray park and playground uh, would be I think astronomical, um, and and I seriously doubt whether CPAC or the town would fund those courts. Uh, although we could achieve 500 plus feet, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, many hundreds of thousands of dollars to get an ADA walkway and an access road there. So, so I I'm sensitive to the time. It's seven o'clock, and and we don't want to take up more more of your time this evening. I think we've gotten some feedback. I think we need to come together as a group again, uh, have a con uh, that's one staff, and then also have a conversation again with with Ryan and other members of the the association and um, see what we can do here. And and frankly, you know, I know CPAC meets on Thursday night. They begin their public hearing. Um, I'm hoping they will be generous enough with staff and allow us a little more time before taking a vote on pickleball um, because they have weekly meetings throughout December. So I'm hoping they will give us a little more time to, to, to gather information and, and work this challenge because we all want pickleball to happen in Amherst. It's just, it's a conundrum. And if it were easy, somebody would have said, hey, this is the easy answer, and we got a lot of smart people working on this, and nobody has really come up with the, you know, the answer. So thanks. Yeah, understood. I appreciate you both joining. Uh, I guess Matt can ask you real quick from a timing perspective. You know, we usually meet monthly, um, and I was thinking so the next time would be sort of early January. When again will CPAC have its final recommendations? I would expect if you that, do. I would expect that the CPA committee will vote on the proposals before the next recreation meeting. Okay. All right. Very good. Um Jonas and Sanjay. But but also, you know, just as I said before, the vote for CPA is funding, not location. Understood. Yep. Uh, Jonas. Yeah, I'll go quickly. Um, will if if there were um, for instance, some extra costs, maybe around sound abatement or maybe moving it slightly within Kiwanis, would there be any possibility of pickleball advocates 
helping uh, basically fundraising to uh, uh, in, in a similar way that there's a fundraising effort to have the high school playing field be turf, not uh, grass. And could that be defrayed um, kind of a partnership? It's an interesting thought. I don't know that that, that community is organized well enough to be able to do any kind of significant fundraising, but right. it would certainly uh, help tremendously. Yeah. And uh, I've apparently no one from that community is on the call tonight. Were they invited? Presumably. Uh, we're uh, expecting to see. We were expecting to hear. I guess I was expecting to hear a pro um, from all the people. Uh, kind oh, of there, there is at, at the CPA have, have received dozens and dozens of letters uh, pro uh, pickleball. Just didn't hear them tonight. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Just not. Just not at this meeting tonight. But at the at the CPA meetings, yes. Very good. All right. Sanjay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Just briefly to reiterate something I said several months ago when this first came up that um, my opinion is strong that the development of pickleball should not remove other recreational opportunities. And I think the sighting at Kiwanis was done with that in mind. Um, it certainly might be possible at other places, but most specifically, the notion of returning to the idea of replacing the tennis courts at Mill River with pickleball, to me, is exactly the wrong thing for the town to be doing and for recreation to be doing. We should be looking at adding opportunities, not um, sacrificing one opportunity for the benefit of another. Uh, and if one were to do that, one might then face a situation where another group of people organizes in objection to a given plan. Um, maybe just very briefly, uh, you know, I think there was some discussion of different siting within Kiwanis. Uh, my concern with that is given some of the things that Ryan has said and some of the things I've read, uh, that the objections from this particular group of citizens do not end at sound and continue to cover the sort of I will say classical objections of traffic and parking um, and was clear from the public comment that this group of citizens, either individually or collectively, is prepared to take serious action against the town. Um, whether that's for real or not, it's hard to predict and hard to see into the future. Uh, but um, I wonder how much effort it's worth thinking about alternate sites at Kiwanis given that the sound objection is not the uh, is not the whole of the objections that we're hearing from this group of citizens. Thank you, Sanjay. All right, Dave and Amy, I know you're looking to uh, move on out of here. We've got, yeah, hopefully you've got some, some good feedback so far from us as kind of individuals, but also just some common themes relative to wanting to understand a little bit more about the the kind of the science behind the noise, noise attenuation. Um, I think what I've heard pretty resoundingly is that people are comfortable that the vetting process for the site, you know, was pretty robust. Um, if folks have disagreement, you know, just, just raise your hand. But um, we all certainly here are interested in having pickleball be part of the town's portfolio of, of uh, opportunities for us as well. So. Um, encourage you to continue to do what you can to, to push forward and make it happen. Very good. All right. Thank you both for joining. Um, I know we still have a, a couple items on here. Um, Ray, um, we had mentioned, so for the OSRP update, um, Rob, I see you in the attendee list. I think that with that not being quite as time sensitive, uh, we'd like to just push that back to January so we can focus on uh, the other items that are on here. So sorry for for having you wait so long, but we'll try to keep this thing, um, you know, keep keep our timeline a little bit more compressed here. So with that note, um, the next item on the list would be a winter programming review from Ray. I, I was just talking to Ray because, you know, I got my mailer. Uh, I can't remember when this exactly showed up, but at, like as this showed up, a friend of mine had talked to me about the downhill skiing option. Um, for my kids, which I'm super excited about and, and, uh, and you know, didn't know about right away. So I, I thought this would be a, a great thing for Ray to do as these things come out, or just as they're getting ready to introduce new programming, just to kind of walk us through it. So, you know, as, as champions for what your group does, Ray, uh, would love to hear from you firsthand kind of where your head is. So if you guys have this, you know, you can follow along. Otherwise, 
Ray, you want to just hit the high notes of some of the the uh, the new offerings that that we're going to be bringing out. I will go very quickly. Uh, I know we went over a little bit here. The ski program, uh, it's something that we've been looking at since I came in uh, a couple of years ago. It is, it's been in our offerings before and was, uh, and, and, and we lost it at some point around COVID and around uh, uh, staff reshuffling. Um, uh, we did make a commitment to bring that back this year. We, we are, uh, it's it's a combination of uh, uh, young recreational club folks that we we have some parents that are going out with them. We have we're up at Wachusett Mountain, and it is right now it's filled. We're trying to be be creative about trying to find ways to to get a um, there's a there's a considerable wait list for us, but we're hoping to grow that ski program, that downhill ski program for us in the future in a way that that I think. You know, maybe we even surprise ourselves a little bit at how just how quickly and how popular that offering was when it came out. Um, Can I ask real quick on that? So so right now, people would register for the seat. When you said there's a wait list, people register for the season or is it a week by week? It's a, there are six sessions, uh, which includes uh, if, if there are people who want to do an introductory lesson, there are lessons involved in that also. So there's an option of of renting equipment there's an option of getting ski lessons there is there is uh, uh and uh, renting equipment ski lessons and i think there's one other potential uh added cost in there but for people who want to go and ski it is basically you're um we're we are taking care of the bus so so it wound up being a really good price for people who are interested um uh, which was, it was able to give us a group discount and and ready to go. Okay, um, I I may not have been clear though. Is it you would register for all six sessions, or is it you? Yeah, you're, oh, yes, it is. You are registered okay. for a package. You're there for six sessions. The club goes out six times. All right, and you've already filled it up, which is it's fantastic. from January until February break. Great, exciting stuff. Cool. Yeah, glad to hear that back on. It is exciting. Jean? Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Um, considering the weather these past years, uh, what happens if, you know, you can't go or, you know, any of the sessions are canceled? Or do they certain kind of refund? Uh, is that clear to the participants? I believe that the mountains have a way of making magic. <laughs> um if there is if we know the winters have been hard and the skiing hasn't been as predictable but uh we we are uh it's it it will we, we will definitely uh work with groups if there's just no skiing available if it ends up being 50 degrees and and sunny the whole winter time uh, we will definitely be working with people all right any other items on here to share with us? Um, this dance, dance uh, sorry, go, no, well, go the ahead. I just under new, I also see dance fitness fusion under adult activity events as a new one. That's a, I can definitely, uh, that's actually a, a neat segue in because the person who is responsible for putting that together is also the person who's responsible for Winterfest. <laughs> All right. And so I can merge those and bring her to the, bring her to the panel. That would be great. Thank you, Ray. Bring in bring in our outreach director, Becky Demling, and presenting her. She she is, of course, one of the main things that she's doing here for us is in coordinating. We just moved from Mary Maple and we're getting into Winterfest now. Uh, she also has brought in part of her her uh, uh uh part of part of what she's been concentrating on in outreach is in is in growing many of our community ed programs. And so I'll let Becky speak to dance first. You're on mute, Becky. On mute, Becky. Thanks. Um, so yes, one thing I did work on this fall was trying to get new programming in um, to add to our repertoire. I will say, honestly, there's not a lot of space available for programming given um, 
the adjusted times at the middle school and high school and the frequency of reservations at the bank center. It is a little bit of a challenge, um, particularly with the uncertainty going forward with the Jones Library and where that's going to be. Um, but we were able to bring in, um, we have two dance fusion classes. One is a conscious movement. It's reformer Pilates type classes. Um, they're taught by someone who's also an instructor at a Pilates studio um, in the area who's doing it at a much reduced rate, you know, for Amherst Recreation. Um, so we have one is a more serious workout, one is more of a, you know, conscious mind body breathing connection. Um, we also worked with the Hitchcock Center to bring in some family science programming. And um, we, one of the connections I was able to make is offering a baby and toddler sign language program, as well as an adult basic sign program. So those were the classes we were able to bring in. Um, we're looking at other things to bring in for the spring, but this is where we were able to start and find space to run programming for the fall, or for the That's winter, perfect. sorry. Excellent. I had a quick question for space. The Do we, do we do anything in the South Amherst Public Library? Uh, we are running, um, the sign language courses are gonna be at the South Amherst Library. The okay. South Library main hall is actually really hard to get into. We're oh, using really? Okay. Um, right. It's gorgeous. Down yeah. is, it's fantastic. We're using the downstairs room at the Munson um, for some of our courses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, do you want to jump into Winterfest then? Uh, sure. So um, Winterfest is, we've gotten some donations in. Um, I don't know how much I mentioned last time I spoke with you all, but um, this year we're um, planning Winterfest to not have snow, um, just as a safer bet. We can add activities if there is snow like pop-up sledding things like that but we're we're going on the more cautious side and planning that we won't have snow but we'll have you know cold weather so our kickoff games are going to be at the mill river recreation area we're going to use the basketball courts for um street hockey games we're going to have um foam snowball fights on the tennis courts um, we'll have distance tosses with foam snowballs and um, a couple other penguin races, things like that. So it'll be non-snow based family fun. It'll be free and open to all in the community. Um, Summerlin floors, uh, flooring is um, our Winterfest opening game sponsor. So we're really grateful to them. Um, we're also gonna do a craft fair, our first annual Winterfest craft fair, which is kind of like a fundraiser um, because um, we charge a, a tabling fee. We don't take any of the profit from the vendors. Um, thus far, we have 38 vendors who've requested to um, table at the event. I do have to get over to the bank center and measure the room to see how many I can accommodate. Um, and that will kind of determine how many tables we can have. Um, honestly, my goal is to keep it a little smaller than I might otherwise want. I'm leaning towards the 20 to 25 table, enough that there's variety, but not so much, never run a large craft fair before. Um, so I wanna make sure it's done well, as opposed to done big. Um, the Cultural Council, several members of the Cultural Council have offered to help. They were actually instrumental in um, helping me find some vendors. They sent out a call um, to some of their grant recipients. Um, so I was able to use them. So they've been a great partner in this. Um, Amherst College has stepped up. Um, the Bonanski uh, Museum of um, 
Natural uh, History and the Mead Art Museum are going to run special Winterfest programming. Um, we have a the Amherst History Museum um, and Historical Society, sorry, um, are running a history of ice making in Amherst uh, topic um, discussion. And we have a couple other things we're exploring before we end the, um, oh, another big one, working with Amherst College, we're gonna do a National Women and Girls in Sports um, Day as part of Winterfest at Amherst College in their gym. And we'll end the, the week with a luminaria and fire and ice on the town common. But that's so, it. Yeah. Should be fun. We're going again, instead of two weeks, we're making sure we do one week really well before we look to expand. Very good. I think I may have asked you this before, but in terms of the um, listings of the events, um, how is how are the activities going to be uh, publicized? Um, so right now, um, I'm getting the Winterfest Facebook page reconfigured up and like updated and all that before. It's it's already live, but doing background things too. So when I update it with sponsors and all that, um, that can go live. We'll also put it on our Amherst Rec website as well as the town of Amherst um, community calendar. Um, I did put out flyers with the major dates. Um, we gave out at Mary Maple, we gave out a hundred craft bags where kids could make their own Mary Maple. And inside of that, I had a little save the date flyer um, with some of the bigger um, winter fest activities on it. Um, we'll also be working with the chamber and the bid who are community partners in Winterfest to have them help push out the information. Okay. Anything in the bulletin? Yeah, we'll do a press release through the town of Amherst. Okay. Um, Sanjay. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Becky sounds great. Well, well done. Tremendous energy you're bringing to the project. It's really <laughs> exciting. Um, and I, I appreciate the uh, plan for snow and be ready to capitalize if it comes approach. Excellent. Um, one question. I know the Mill River basketball courts were recently completely refurbished at not insignificant expense. And uh, Ray, are we are you confident that roller hockey is OK for that surface? It's it's sneaker hockey. Oh, it's foot it's hockey. hockey. It's foot it's hockey. hockey. Okay. Thank you, Sasha. Question, question answered. <laughs> I, I just panicked there for a second. I was thinking, wait, do we have roller hockey coming out? I mean, I know. you know I no, loved roller hockey. No, skate, Becky, you but, said you yeah, said street hockey. It's that my mind turned street hockey into roller <laughs> hockey. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you, Sanjay. Any other um feedback for Becky? Jean? Um, not feedback. I mean, that sounds wonderful. Is there any food involved? Any kind of food vendors or like at the craft fair or, or, or any, any people any selling food or? So I've been uh, in discussions with the mill district. Um, they're definitely going to do s'mores um, at Mill River. Um, I'm trying to figure out how much, I don't know if you know, like how much work it is to get a food <laughs> truck in the permitting. Um, so honestly, with the mill district right there, I'm, I'm honestly trying to avoid it and work out ways. Um, I was talking to the mill district about discounts to eat at um, the river locations. Um, nice. So that's what we're trying to, that's the route I'm taking for food okay. for the kickoff. Um, and at the craft fair, yes, I've selected a couple vendors that sell like fudge and gourmet popcorns and like snackier kind of things, but it is going to be at the bank center. So it would also be hopeful that people would go to one of our downtown businesses. Nice. Okay. Thanks. Right. Jonas. Not so much a question, but, um, it's an amazing amount of programming and I'm wondering, Seems like you're going to be rivaling first night in Northampton at this rate. Um, you might be. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like. 
Um, and then just uh, the ice making. I, I, one of my favorite uh, corporate slogans I saw was in the back of an ice truck. And it said, uh, so-and-so ice for the last hundred years, secret family recipe. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. Um, great. Well, yeah, Becky, awesome job. Um, let us know. I, I think last time we talked about, you know, if you needed to vet some ideas, reach out to us. Um, we had, I think, uh, Gene, myself, Jeremy, and Jonas all had volunteered. So if yeah. you need any more feedback, get Ray, a hold of us. But otherwise, a spreadsheet. Pardon? Oh, I was going to ask Ray. Ray, could you send them that spreadsheet I sent you? I, yes, I will. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, otherwise, we're going to stay out of your way because it um, sounds like that's when good things happen. Oh, I mean, I, I and I also want to say I told Ray this, um, but uh, we presented to the town manager the sensory proposal the day after oh, we yeah, had yes. the um, recreation meeting, and I want to say like the commission's feedback was actually really helpful in me adjusting how I was presenting to the town manager so that it was like clear to him what the goals of the program were and not so like that was really helpful feedback paul was very supportive um of the program he gave us some outreach to do to get feedback um additionally from the proposals so ray um denise luckenby and i met with um arps administration particularly the special ed um administrators they were incredibly supportive and really loved the idea of the program. So we're gonna be presenting to CPAC, which is the Special Ed Parents Advisory Committee, not the mm -hmm. conservation <laughs> um, group. Um, so we're gonna be presenting to them the earliest we could get on their agendas for um, January 5th. Um, so that's that's moving along, even though it does, it's not public fully yet. Um, it is moving along and we're dotting our I's, crossing our T's with hopefully a rollout in January of that program. And one other thing that's not on the agenda, but I'll bring it up anyway, is um, a survey from Amherst Rec about community wants and needs for us looking at program and outreach and what barriers people have in accessing our programming so we can do a little community evaluation um is going to be going out within the next couple weeks okay that is very good to know yeah. all right okay awesome well thank you becky and appreciate you hanging on so late with us here tonight <laughs> thank you so much have a great night you too bye all right uh matt i know we you know Pickleball isn't the only thing on CPAC. Any any um, other updates for some of the other projects you've heard? So you've heard from all of the uh, all of the groups. I think at this point, anything to share with us um, coming out of those conversations? Uh, not really. I think that um, so we reviewed the recreation proposals. Uh, before Thanksgiving, um, I think there isn't a whole lot of discussion during the presentation phase. The discussion that there was, you know, there was public comment from the Misty Meadows Neighborhood Association, and uh, pretty pretty similar to what you heard tonight. Uh, maybe th they've gotten done more research and now they have more information, so um, we're moving forward there. Um, a lot of the other projects, uh, the commentary was not dissimilar to um, what we had in the Recreation Commission. So um, we this coming Thursday is the public comment session and then we begin our deliberations. So deliberations will probably last for a few weeks um, in December and usually the town um, helps us with a suggestion of how to uh, get a, how to prioritise different things and how to, what we should... In, include and what we shouldn't include, but we're going to move through that in the next few weeks. Very good. Any any um, questions for Matt? All right, well, have fun with the deliberations. I, I know they can take time. 
All right. Yeah. Uh, so the last item I have on here, just as you know, Gene and Ray and I have been talking over the you know these months or whatever that we've we've kind of shifted some of the how we're organizing uh, our meetings around is uh, wanted to have an opportunity to hear more from each of us, you know, specifically, right? Like you are all volunteering to help champion for, you know, the needs of the town from a rec perspective is, are there some areas that you would like to see more attention paid? Uh, some questions around maybe potential future programming, but just really, an opportunity to for Ray to hear from us the things that us as you know volunteers on this organization uh, that that we're passionate about in the in the community, um, and so really kind of open floor here for anybody to raise their hand. You know, we're not we're not asking Ray to do anything at this point. We're just trying to um, give Ray some 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 more food for thought um, as he you know contemplates what's next. Um, all right. So yeah, if you just want to raise your hand, Chris, I see your hand first. So a lot of the things, and I mean, thank you for having me on the board, obviously. Um, but the, the thing that it seems to be talking to people, um, around town and with coaches and with some of the younger parents and, you know, the kids with younger kids is it, it seems to be the lack of and I could be outdating myself. I mean, I, I remember when we had a, a ton more things when I was a kid here, but that was also 40 years ago. Times have significantly changed. Like sort of athletic feeder systems, um, you know, for, and I think every, to try to tackle every sport at once is, is just tough. It's, I'm just, I'll pick lacrosse because there's a guy, you know, sitting right in front of us, but, you know, feeder systems for girls lacrosse, at, at really like ground level. I mean, it's, and I don't even know if it starts at the, you know, the after school programs um, with, with some of the athletes from that program. I don't know how it starts. It just, I think we're hearing some of the girls basketball numbers uh, for, you know, who tried out this year and, and then talking to other parents. It's just phenomenal how some sports are just, like going the not the wrong direction and it's not just here i'm not saying it's i'm not picking on amherst or anything like that right it's just you know uh just a, i'm not saying lack of programs but just maybe a different outlook at programs to how to how to introduce these kids to different athletics to keep it to keep it going um and obviously I, ray obviously knows my uh cit program um thoroughly in favor of but also you know like, like my daughter this summer this winter does not do a program right she needed to volunteer somewhere where where can you know right now i got her five days a week at home i'm ready to pound my head into the floor you know i mean when she's on the lacrosse field when she's on the volleyball court i know where you know that that leads that leads to good things this is this is a tough time i gotta wait until you know i, I get it my email from the shillings and, and McDougal was letting me know lacrosse is coming, you know, that that's some of my concerns with, with rec because I, and I also think that if you get those little feeder programs, it leads into, you know, other, other programs, you know, people, people, there's, there's a lot of recreational athletes out there that seem to get forgotten in the, in the system right now. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't know if you knew actually, Chris, but but the development, the girls across feeder system is actually developed through Ray, since Ray coaches uh, oh. in the spring. Yeah, um, he is he is the voice of of youth girls lacrosse in town. Hopefully, you keep doing it for us, Ray. Yeah. All right. Um, well, well, I'm just I'm just trying to make sure I can keep Chris from banging his head too much. I got to make sure. <laughs> I'm gonna... <laughs> Well, it, it's just, I don't know. And, and I mean, I think some of it's, some of it's the parents too. They just, and it, it's not the cost. It can't, I mean, for some of the parents, yes, it is the cost, but your programs are very reasonably priced. You know, I don't know if they're too reasonably priced. I, I don't know, because honestly, I, I just look at this, this area. I don't go to like Northampton because I'm not going to drive my kid over to Northampton. Um, it's just, 
I, I guess I'm still shocked. I mean, uh, against some of the parents, just they just I don't know. They don't want to have their kids do anything, or the kids don't want to do anything. I didn't even ask my daughter what she wants to do. Last year, I told her and her friend she was playing JV and varsity lacrosse, and honestly, it was one of the best experiences she had. You know, she loved it. You know, it, it's just sometimes that I mean, there is a bad push to a kid. I mean, I don't think she's going to make you know North Carolina lacrosse, but just being part of that team aspect and and Ray, you and I have talked before. Like, you know, if you have that program. It should be mandatory that a girl, a couple of girls or boys from JV and varsity lacrosse, if it fits into their schedule, go down and help your programs. That's that's you know, I would I would send my kid. I'd drop her off, pick her up, whatever. That that com- the connection they have with the younger kids is is crucial for those younger kids to stay in the sport and just kind of feel that camaraderie thing. It's huge. All right. Thank you. Thank Chris. you, Chris. Yeah. All right, you got few more hands up here and don't want to totally uh overwhelm you Ray. but let's uh let's keep going around the horn here Jean? overwhelm me please overwhelm me <laughs> <laughs> um well, i'm come from a soccer family so soccer is always big um on my radar and i remember there used to be a soccer fest that i think it was at, i think it was umass athletics that actually put it together but i remember coming here to amherst when i came for my interview and there was this huge banner that said you know, soccer fest. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the right time. We've we've reached it. <laughs> um, so that used to take place in the summer. My son later, when he was in, I think he, maybe he think it was, I mean, he could have been middle school. Was, yeah, I think it was high school. He actually volunteered um, at this soccer fest. I think it was one of sports sports clips or somebody was the sponsor. But anyway, having something like that, like a tournament where we had, there, I mean, we can get soccer clubs or. Um, you know, teams from around the area to come and have a big tournament and, you know, in the summer, I think would be fantastic. Of course, we'd have to find a place to play that, but they did do it at, um, at UMass. So, you know, also making those connections with UMass, with their, like, like you were just saying, Chris, you know, having that connection with the players who are more advanced, you know, getting them excited about, you know, where that sport can take you when you're older. Um, I think that would be, would be fantastic if we could, you know, get the high school kids involved, get the middle school kids involved, girls and boys, you know, uh, you know, have them volunteer. They would they would do like little clinics. But if we had like a tournament and the clinics, you know, something like that, obviously start small um, to bring in, you know, just that soccer experience, um, you know, at different levels. I, I, I agree. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's good for the community. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Hundred percent. Yeah. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Jonas. Yep, fellow soccer obsessive, um, along with Gene. Um, and I used to live in Boston, and like when I came out here, I couldn't stop just looking. Like, oh, that would be a great place for a soccer field. Oh, that like people's farms. It didn't matter. Like that should be a grass field. <laughs> um, and then um, actually the um, the all sport in Northampton was another, I, I looked at that when I was deciding to come out here. Um, oh, we're going to play soccer there. So I feel like actually, and then I've been looking um, even like a place like Bramble Hill has this huge barn that doesn't get used. I'm like, ah, indoor soccer. Um, and I mean, it seems a little, a little impractical, but um, I'm, I do wonder if there are unused places in the, in the town um, that you could do indoor soccer, but then also um I feel like maybe we just need to know. I don't think we need to push. We shouldn't be pushing towards one sport. It should be no. lots, obviously, lots of options. So, like, do we know? Um, are there are there more opportunities for winter versus summer versus fall? Do we can we kind of assess those things and like um, that might be maybe worth uh, because again, it's yeah, we shouldn't be you know every everyone if they give an opportunity they're going to gravitate towards different different areas um so there you go yeah. yeah thank you jonas um sanjay me oh, you're me sanjay there we go actually, i actually have two i'll try to be quick uh first uh, this is a question for Ray and may require a little bit of work. Ray, if a group of citizens donated 
the materials and labor to assemble an ice skating rink at Kendrick Park, would Amherst Rec maintain said rink? You don't have to answer that now, but the playground at Kendrick Park has been a huge success in the warmer months, despite some naysaying on the part of even members of the town council. And uh, it'd be great to see Kendrick Park used for outdoor winter recreation. Um, I'm basically 100% confident that I could, over the course of like a day and a half, get together the fundraising and labor and materials to put together something. Um, but <laughs> it does take work, right? Occasional reflooding, uh, shoveling, although if you left some shovels out, people might do their, you know, anyway, there would be details to figure out. But I think for a New England town to not have any outdoor public skating is a shame. I am aware that REC did try a rink uh, at Community Field a couple of years ago, I think maybe pre-COVID or such, it was not successful. It's not a good location. Uh, Kendrick Park is the spot, as I think has been demonstrated by the success of the playground in the summer months. Um, so that was one. And it's December 4th. It's not too late. We could do it. <laughs> um, and then the second, I think, uh, goes back to Chris's comments at the beginning and, and some of the others, right? Uh, um, I'm not a member of the Amherst Soccer Commission. I want to go on the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things I've observed is that it's extremely difficult for parents, especially parents who did not grow up in town, to figure out what's available. And I actually had some informal conversations with, um, with Amherst Hockey, I'm president of Amherst Baseball and at least a couple of other organizations, uh, soccer included, about some sort of centralized web resource. So amherstyouthsports.org, right? And uh, the sort of model I was beginning to pitch was, well, each organization throws 50 bucks a year in. Um, you know, a website costs two or 300 a year to maintain with domain <laughs> registry and hosting. Uh, and that there could even then be some centralized marketing and advertising around such a site. So there are multiple paths to that. One would be to just do it privately, right? Um, but another might be to have REC do it. Now, there are subtleties to it, right? Does REC want to be in the business of advertising non-REC programs? Um, that's something this commission could talk about, right? Uh, so I don't want to... I don't want to dismiss that as an issue, right? It's something to, to talk about and consider. But right now, like, how the heck are you supposed to find what's available in the different seasons? I mean, it's just almost impossible, right? It's just word of mouth. Or if you happen to grow up in the area, you know what's out there. So those are my two. Fun. Um, I, I don't necessarily have wish list items. I would just say at what point, as we think about spring season, uh, I know you're just going to start with basketball, but um, as we're trying to build the pipeline and get people interested, at what point do you have office resource that's able to start thinking and marketing and planning for spring sports, just, um, you know, to, to keep momentum going and get people excited in advance? Again, that one you need to answer at this point, but I do feel like there may be opportunity um, whether it's like through a website, which, which sounds like a really great idea, but, um, just keeping like the drumbeat going for sports, even outside of their seasons to get people prepped for it, or just kind of winding down and thinking about the next season. So. Yeah. All right. Um, very good. So yeah, um, I've I've jotted some notes down too, Ray. And again, this is it's food yeah. for thought. But um, and obviously, any of you guys, you like just reach out to Ray anyway, um, independently if you have some follow up on this stuff. But hopefully, Ray, there's you're... some things there, Ray, that can that can get sort of assimilated into your planning process for 2024. Uh, ho hopefully, there's some some like just do it type things we can actually put out there. But not trying to make your life harder here. Trying to trying to make it easier for your customer. I'm, right and Ray, Ray, remember if you need help, feel free. I mean, just you have all of my information. I just won't give you my social security number. So, 
Absolutely. But, I really, I mean, I, I appreciate, thank you, Andy, for putting this as a, as an agenda item, because it, I mean, it, it, it is helpful to see that that's, those are, uh, if, if this is an advisory board, then this gives us a chance to turn you all into advisors. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I hear you all. These are all very reasonable uh, uh, your requests of uh, uh, looking at what we do. It's not like any of your any of your comments here are are inventing something that we don't like that that's just another world. We're not we're not reinventing the wheel, certainly, and we're not we're not trying to imagine life on Mars. These are things that we already have lined up as as uh, you know, uh, ways to enhance the programming that we have and can make happen realistically. Excellent. Uh, Matt, see your hand up. Yeah, sort of building on uh, what uh, Jane was talking about and um, uh, to some extent, Chris. Uh, so Soccer Fest was put on by UMass and I forget if it was the Sp School of Sports Management that organized that. And I've seen other sort of interactions between um, UMass teams and, and youth teams uh, Sometimes, often they seem to go sort of because somebody knows the coach of the UMass team or whatever. It's very ad hoc. So, or, or an Amherst College coach of some team brings, like my my daughter did a session with the UMass uh, field hockey team. But all those things are very ad hoc. So I don't know if it makes sense. But if you had some kind of more direct relationship with UMass um, and potentially Amherst College as well for kind of mediating and making these things happen. Because a lot of times it is actually in both of your interests. Um, a lot of the UMass teams actually want to volunteer time with youth teams. Um, uh, and, and, and there's a school of sports management. Also, those people um, want to be, to some extent, involved in volunteering with youth sports. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's something I think for you to think about. Do, do do we have the pipeline into either of those colleges, Ray? We do. Uh, we have we've we've been building on relationships with both UMass and Amherst Athletics. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, in my work with Andy and Girls Lacrosse, we we had a tremendous resource with a nationally uh, a nationally renowned uh, lacrosse program, and we were able to get. Uh, a connection with their program and with uh, with their their players and as a resource they came in it's inspiration to get uh, young athletes looking at college athletes in the area and you're right UMass does value that also because they're trying to make connections with the community around them as an Amherst College alum who still knows all of the Amherst College who sort of is this close to the Amherst College administration and and you know I've, I'm close to the Amherst College basketball program and that sort of thing Amherst College is also a a, a resource that's been good for us uh we're we're working through other town and gown relationships we are building uh, with Amherst College, we're building with UMass. Uh, we've had as a resource uh, for our, we mentioned about our morning, our, our MMMP program, the morning the morning mentoring program with the middle school. Uh, UMass has been an incredible resource for us athletes and other the athletic department has was our first major partner from UMass over there. And they're there three or four days a week. Uh, uh, working with hockey stars, working with their cheerleading team, working with uh, working with their their women's lacrosse team, their their people who are putting in time to try and spend with our with you know, with with the kids that we serve, and so that is an important part of of I I, I like to think that it's it's part of my my focus when I sold myself as the right guy for this position that that connecting those pieces of gener I hear so many of your comments are about generational connections or about about young athletes and older athletes uh you know competing like athletes on television competing for national championships and on a scholarship and our in our town uh professionals even I mean we we talk about 
trying to build some generation of uh, you know, uh, non-celebrity folks in the community that are that are running and training for a living. Like there are ways that that we want to try and connect generations of people who are at different stages of doing this. And it is challenges to to Chris's point. I think it is a different challenge today, given all of the different uh, uh, influences that kids see, but but we still there is never uh, good role modeling and good like good modeling never really goes out of style and having people some people willing to spend time and having people willing to think about what that next generation of Amherst of Amherst participants looks like it never really goes out of style so I I hear a lot of generational interest in the comments that you all are sharing here all right, we're um, got a couple more hands up. Just we're nine, we're at seven forty-eight right now. So just uh, keep that in mind as we uh, as we get more chance to talk to each other. Oh, did you call me? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, um, with UMass being a public institution, are there any guidelines on what of their facilities are public? I mean, I I've taken my son to their their fields, and I'm always looking over my shoulder. I've never had, uh, I've never been, you know, kicked off. I know Amherst and Amherst colleges, there's a couple of fields that kid, local kids go to. And sometimes, you know, I feel like that's with being a private college is a little less, a little more tenuous for them to be there, but just wondering if there's any kind of a de facto uh, arrangement or understanding. Um, UMass does have proprietary, uh, uh, control over their fields and that sort of thing. It's not, it is a public institution, but they, but they can. Your question is largely legal. So I want to stop and leave it there because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to claim legal. You said I can go on this field, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have, I mean, that has been an issue in the past where town, uh, it can be, it can maybe to a lesser extent, uh, town entities like recreation, but more so private, private groups are looking for space to go and play. And so they say, we'll just go until they kick us off. And that's not the relationship we as the town want to have with them, with their, with their, with their spaces. Uh, Jean? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, you were talking, Ray, about, you know, like with the lacrosse, you know, finding, you know, these nationally great players to connect with, like Amherst College, the men, they just were runners up for you know for for soccer for third division in the country so like in and hockey I mean you know at UMass like you know how many a couple years ago they were you know one national like yeah, we, yeah. we have we have it right here mm -hmm. you know we have that that high standard that high class uh players and teams and yeah it'd be great to you know just make those connections excellent all right um let's see we're near the end here uh any old business or new business Ray, anything from your side? I would just say that, uh, and you know, as the as the last just comment on the pickleball situation, I would just say that uh, uh, please be prepared. Just to plant a seed here, be prepared in case we need to do a special session at the end of December. I, I would certainly follow Matt's interest on that a little bit, also, as we're looking for. You know, uh, you know I apologize. The 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 you know, I, I probably could have gotten you the Misty Meadows information a lot earlier than you received it, but be prepared in case there is a follow-up conversation that needs to be had. I am I feel like our conversations are moving in a pretty good direction. It, the, the Thursday's meeting is not about the site, but just be prepared in case we need to come back together for a quick sort of thumbs up, thumbs down. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Okay, good to know. Um, I guess the only item that I was curious to know is if we have a status on the turf at the high school. If, if are you aware of? I know there's been. Not, I am not a. I'm not an authority on that and the and that status. There may be people who have a little bit more insight on that, but I don't have any official status on that. Okay, Gina, I, I, I actually have a question about that also. Um, I hope I'm not jumping, Jean. But um, go ahead. The, the the as far as I understand it, the CPA grant that went to the high school was contingent on there being a turf field, 
And that needs to be made. A, people need to be aware of that because if they're trying to save money by not by putting grass instead of turf, but they lose the seven hundred thousand, they don't actually save money. Yeah, that's a big distinction. <laughs> uh, so you... that's just my understanding. But if that's if my understanding is correct, then people need to be aware of that. Yeah, no, I think I think you are correct, Matt. You know, the original it, it was it was recommended. I, I don't want to say poison pill, but it was that was that language was inserted to to really mm -hmm. make sure that the money wasn't co-opted to do a different plan. Yeah. Now um, maybe the town council can revisit that, but my I understanding think, is yeah, um, effectively the turf option is cheaper with that provision. Uh, yeah, or a cost equivalent, maybe. Yeah. Um, Gene, what did you yeah, talk about? Uh, just real quick, uh, I just was wondering if we've raised any uh, updates on going to a hybrid meeting or we'll be able to meet in person at all. Any updates on that? Dave Zomek, I will, I'll, Dave Zomek is my, will be my, my uh, uh, angle in there. I will get back to you on that this week. Thanks. Apologies. Okay. No, uh, thanks for following up. Um, I guess, yeah, if we do have to reconvene, let's um, let's make sure that we get some conversation or update on turf. Um, Ray, if you could just sort of put that um, in pencil on your, your list. All right. And then um, I guess just report the chairs. Oh, yeah, Sanjay. Go ahead. In what ways is the turf project part of the brief of this commission? That's not entirely clear to me. And I, I just would want to avoid us getting wading into a topic that is highly controversial right now, you know, without saying which side any individual on this commission might be favoring. But uh, it's not clear to me that that's really part of our brief. Yeah, Sanjay, I, so my perspective is I would like to get an update, right? Because it is something that I've been, people have asked me about, assuming that on the rec commission, we would have some sort of information around it, not just, I'm not up to speed at all, but I'm not, I agree, I'm not looking for this committee to okay. interject itself in, into that process. Okay, but to me that, and I'm not I'm not trying to be critical of you, Andy, right? I like information too, but to me that mm -hmm. sounds more like Andy McDougall as an individual wanting to know what's going on than, because I just don't know that this commission has a role in that project. I mean, that's, that's a fair point, um, Jonas. If that turf field was, would this turf field be open for non-school recreation? If it was, then I think we do have a, a, a stake in it because availability then is an issue. And that, the, I, will, mean, I will put a personal in, uh, yeah. out, and that would be that turf is going to be more available than grass because we've had so many rain out where, you know, the fields are unplayable because of grass. Well, even aside from that, turf fields are four times, you can play four times as many hours on a turf field than a grass field. So I I would I would say I think uh, you guys are linking up on the same uh, in the same way to try and respond to Sanjay's important question. I had the same question. I wasn't I'm just taking my my marching orders. I'm going to go and get some information. I like information also. I think that information is useful for us, despite the fact that it is not, I'll be clear, it is not out. I'm not involved as a decision maker in that process. I'm supporting the process. I would like to give them input. I'd like to, because we will be beneficiaries of, of that, of the, of that project. We will be using that space. And so to Jonas's point, um, um, you know, if the project, if they say, well, we're going to have it next year, that's not a quote, please don't, you know, the, uh, the track <laughs> is going to be in next year, then we can start talking about what our role is in using that space and our access. But that's inf that, that's what that information would mean to me. Uh, we can start to think about what how that affects us when it is our time to be involved in that conversation. All right, excellent. Um, Jean, any just kind of report of chairs, anything you want to add? No, I was just yeah, wondering about meetings. Not right. anything, but yeah. Okay. Well, um, 
I know the last two meetings have been longer than ones we've done <laughs> in the past, so appreciate everybody's patience. Um, we'll hopefully be able to streamline things a little bit more as we get a rhythm going, but uh, we're under two hours, so like that's that's a start better than last time. Uh, <laughs> right now, I, I we've got January 11th as the next tentative one, just for the holidays. Ray, keep us posted if you if you need to hear back from us so we can kind of pull the the room here and see if that's doable with uh, with various um, activities happening at the end of the month. Okay. Uh, January 11th is a Thursday. Oh, All right. right. Uh, it didn't. I didn't mean it to be. Yeah. Uh, I may have the wrong date. Then I'm sorry. It's not. Oh, I was looking at December. That's Thursday. why. Yeah. So it'd be the eighth. The eighth. The eighth is Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Sounds All right. Good. Keep us posted, please, Ray. And uh, otherwise, everybody, thanks again for the time and feedback. And um, if we don't meet before, uh, enjoy the rest of uh, 2023. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.